genius is an amorphous term, to be sure, and I actually try to stay away from it in the book. Um, the, what, I, what I talk about in the book mostly is this idea of high achievement, so people becoming great at stuff, becoming really, really good at stuff. Uh, I don't think it's really important to, to make a dividing line some, to try to figure out you know, when you've crossed over into, into genius. The point is um, gathering your resources, doing the best you can, pursuing whatever it is you love to do with, uh, with an intensity and a resilience um, and a passion and, and just going as far as you can possibly go. We've been living with this myth for about 100, 150 years, going back to the time of Darwin, although I'm not blaming Darwin for this. Uh, if, if, if the blame resides anywhere, it's really with Darwin's cousin Francis Galton. We can get into that if you like. But, um, so the idea is that uh, we, we think that it's nature versus nurture, that there's uh, there's genes that, uh, that have all this information that kind of want to push us in a certain direction. And then there's the environment, which is nurture, which is, uh, which is obviously different and kind of an opposing force. And, um, and it's kind of either or. And there's all these studies that are constantly trying to figure out, well, how much is nature? And then add on to the nurture, you know, is it 60% nature and 40% nurture, depending on what trait you're talking about. Well, it turns out that genes don't work that way. Genes don't get you part of the way there, you know, to the point you're born or the point shortly after that or before that. Genes are always interacting with the environment. So the new way to think about this is that it's not nature plus nurture or nature versus nurture. If anything, it's nature interacting with nurture, if you have to use those words. So one of the phrases that scientists are using now is G times E, that is genetics times environment as opposed to G plus E. They call it an additive model. The additive model is, well, you have so much inborn intelligence and then plus what you get in the environment. That would be you know, nature plus nurture. The new, the new model is you can't separate them. You just absolutely cannot separate the effects of genes from the effects of the environment. So all we can do, of course, is to identify the resources that we have in our environments and, and maximize them as best, as best we can. One of the studies is, goes back to 1957 or 58, where these two guys were looking at, at um, rats that had been genetically designed, uh, genetically bred, that is, to be intelligent. And in generation after, intellig after generation, they were incredibly intelligent and, you know, was seen in mazes and things like that. So then they wanted to see, well, what if you subject them to different environments, extreme environments, like uh, sensory deprivation kind of thing or extra treats and you know so-called intellectual stimulation for rats if you can imagine uh, what that is uh, basically it's lots of toys and different textures and sounds and sights and colors and things like that and they wanted to see well what's the additive difference of the environment if you take these these um, these mice that have been bred to be smart compared to these mice that have been bred to be not so smart well turns out that when you subject them to these different environments, actually the mice that, are, that have, have been suppo supposedly bred to be unintelligent um, quite often intersect with the, the intelligence, the uh, performance of the mice that have been bred to be intelligent. And the reason is that you're getting these in interactions which you couldn't have predicted if you were looking at the old additive model of G plus E. So, so that was one of the very early clues that we're looking at a whole new model of genes and environment, that it was this interactive model. Mm -hmm.